Kjura tatoj, tjena tatoj katoa. Me pehe ti mata te nei wahanga. He tapu te kura nga wai nui, he tapu te kura nga moana. Ko ia ko moana nui, ko moana roa, ko moana hakere, ko moana tāpo ko poko. Ko moana uri uri, ko moana oru oru, ko moana tuha tuha, ko moana wai wai. Moana tā noni. Moana tū ki te repo, moana tū ki te wao, moana tā noni ue a te papā tangaro. Te nei taku iri kura, taku iri kau, taku iri iri whakatipua. Ka iri iri a te mahara, ka iri iri a te wānanga, ka iri iri a te tau ira, hei tau. Whano, whano mai te mauri hau me e hui e tāe ki. A kia ora tātou. Tēnei tātou e arahi nei, e te wai. Me pērā te kōrero, te moana o tauranga, e tako to mai rā i waho. Te moana nui e te re mai rā. Ngā maunga, whakahihi o te wahi nei, mau wao tū tonu, tū tonu, tū tonu, o ti rā. Tēnā no tātou katoa. Tēnei anō hoki he uri no Ngāti Hangarau, e mihi ana ki a koutou. Kei raro tonu nei, kei te wairua e rere nei, he pā whaka wairua, he wairere o aku tūpuna. Tēnei ka mihi kauake ki a tātou e pae nei, o ti rā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I'm trying to gather my thoughts at the moment, but as we start on this journey, I'd like to preface, um, preface this with, I suppose, the, the context of the project, and we get that stuff out of the way, and then we sort of get on the real journey. Né? So the, the project fits in this context of what is a hapu-based Māori economy? what is Māori aquaculture um, and how from these mainstream contexts do we as iwi hapu whānau uh, use these tools to get what we need out of them. Ne? Koera te mea nui is that they haven't yet been quantified or qualified within the mātauranga Māori within our Aotearoa context. So therein lies the kaupapa of our project. Uh, one of the other researchers that was just presenting in the other room, the Kelly Rata, and I dreamt up this dream because both of us have um, a romantic interest with restoring traditional practice. We'll put it that way. <coughs> uh, restoring traditional practice. Um, mine, my source of that inspiration stems from my upbringing up in Taitokero, um, in a place uh, in the hapu of Ngāti Hine, a place called Moirewa, where I was just lucky enough to grow up around kuia, kaumatua, uncles and aunties who did very specific things, um, cultural things, cultural practices within uh, my lifetime. And through that I was able to absorb some mātauranga, māramatanga, um, but also some experience. Kelly's comes from her connection and time living in Hawaii, where she was inspired by uh, the practitioners of uh, not only the Roto um, Iko, the, the fish ponds, but the practitioners in Hawaii, they traverse quite a, an array of practices. From Fale to um, Ahupuaha, which is whole system based cultivation. Né? So from our collective uh, source points, we thought, why don't we have a crack at what blue economy looks like, what EBM might look like, um, what aquaculture might look like, if we then uh, use the knowledge we have from our starting points to populate those spaces. <laughs> so that's our starting point. Né? And here's our awesome team. Uh, I'm a bit of a pacer, so I'm going to pace. Ne? Um, on the far side there we have 
uh, Matua Rangiroa Rongonui, who is um, one of the only practitioners left of um, customary traditional fishing methods in our hapu, uh, in my mother's hapu down in Ngāti Ruanui Ngā Ruahine. He was a, a, a big part of this kaupapa. Uh, in the middle we have Fire Babi Tamakehu, who led a lot of the practice-based mahi in our case study in Wanganui, up the Wanganui River with Ngātangata Tiaki. And on this far uh, end here we have Matua Gerard Albert. And Matua Gerard Albert is one of the iwi leaders down in Wanganui, who led a lot of the... Um, the treaty claim mahi um, relating to the Wanganui River, um, who established the new legal construct called Tupua Te Kawa that gave the Wanganui River its own legal personality. Uh, so those are our puna matauranga. And then down the bottom here we have myself, Kelly, um, Te Kite Ora Rolleston Gable, who did amazing mahi. Um, she's very much a youngster to look forward to in the future, and Peter Van Campen from the Nature Conservancy. So this made up our little group here. Um, and as we started to do, to think further um, about these kaupapa and to dive into what Mahi Māori looks like in this context, we started to find different um, collision zones. We'll call them collision zones where mainstream thinking and traditional Māori thinking didn't necessarily match up or didn't necessarily see the world from the same space. Né? So then what we had to do is sort of take a step back and then we looked at, okay, so there are certain concepts in Te Ao Māori, kaitiakitanga for example, that actually come from within Te Ao Māori Ake, right? So it's origin source, um, knowledge, practical application, um, context comes from Te Ao Māori and can't necessarily be translated directly into mainstream English or even mainstream operations. So you get this context where kaitiakitanga um, generally means guardianship or stewardship and that's what people run with, right? But that's not what kaitiakitanga means. That's just the closest concept that people can get to get the, the idea of it. Né? So what we did is we looked at having to put our Māori lenses on first and you do that through a deep understanding of te reo of tikanga, of kawa, of ritenga, and of whakapapa. And so when we started to look at the world from that perspective, that's when we started to understand the positions of our hapu uh, leaders, our hapu kaitiaki, from the context of kaitiaki tanga, manaki tanga, rangatira tanga, from their own hapu-based context. Ne? That is the starting point where our mahi starts to take root. So we put our Māori glasses on and we start to see the world in a little bit of a different context. The, the first point I'd like to make is that that context, that our Māori context, starts with some key building blocks. First one is kawa, right? an understanding of the key life-giving, life-ignition principles. Ne? Kawa, uh, we often refer to them as protocols or um, cultural uh, rules. They determine from our perspective whether something is right or not, or whether something lives or has a life-ignition process or does not. Tikanga is how that life ignition process happens. Right? There's a sequence to events, there's a sequence to mechanisms that 
enables something to be right. That's tikanga. Ritenga are the practices, the physical, tangible rituals that maintain all of that. Right? So the most common one we have today is the revival of the Matariki ceremony. Ne? The Matariki ceremony, it's a ritenga. Behind it are the tikanga, the kawa, that used to be undertaken to ensure the modi, the life-giving energy sources of our hapu and hapu spaces, um, are ignited and are flowing continuously. Kapai? So th these are some of the contexts that we had to dive in before we could actually do the rangahau. So that gave us three contexts of rangahau. The first one was the pokayafa approach. The pokayafa approach in the marae, there, the pokayafa is the beam or the support pillar that is at the front of the house. Right? Its job is to weather storms. Yeah? Kayafa, to weather the storm. That initiative included deep dives into contexts like what we just sort of touched on, right? Wānanga contexts, tikanga. What is the connection between tikanga, kawa and space? What is the connection between practice, tikanga, kawa and space and ataonga? To understand that is the fundamentals of cultivation. <coughs> Pautoko manawa, the pautoko marawa is the beam inside the fare that holds the fare up. So it might be something like this. That for us became an exploration into the enablers and disablers of practice. So looking at the practices that we explored in the first po, progressing into, so what are, what's allowing us or what's disabling us from practicing today? That includes um, a bit of a desktop exercise to look uh, that looks into the different legislative um, and regional policies that could have enablers or disablers in them. And then to look at creating a bit of a roadmap on how we can navigate that as iwi hapu whānau. And then the third pō, tuārongo, which is the pō at the rear of the whare, that pō was centred around the tuakana tēna relationship of us, the tēna, trying to restore, revive and continue practice and some of the key um, tohunga over in Hawaii that we've met along the way who do it, who have got past the reviving stage, who have got past the reclaiming stage, who are at the practice everyday stage. So together they gave us um, an outlook of what are the epistemology and ontology, what are the practice elements that needed to be revitalized, what are um, the spaces that we were able to do that in and the enablers that enabled Fano to practice and then what is the commitment requirement that enables a pāika, um, a pātuna to be up and running and the knowledge system required to keep it running for a hapu. Unfortunately my thing here is not working, it's supposed to be able to see other things there. Anyway, so this is a picture of a pātuna. Uh, it, it's in the Wanganui Museum. It's a miniature model, right? So it sits on the table about this big. The pātuna that are actually in the tai are a lot bigger than that. However, these are some of the um, engineering um, Tawira, the examples that our tupuna had. And so our first mahi was, let's go and explore them. Let's find people that work with these and learn about them, learn how they work, 
how they understand the physics of, a, of the, the awa, how they understand the physics and the biology and the ecology of the tuna. Um, and then apply that to modern day aquaculture and see if we can find either similarities or grey areas where we can populate. Hey. We looked at having wānanga based out in, in, in hapū. So here, um, uncle, is, uncle Rangiroa is explaining to us um, the concept of a whakaparu. A whakaparu is uh, a trap for lamprey. It sits in the, the, the um, bowing edge of the river and it uses the lamprey's susceptibility to dark spaces to create a trap, right? So you create a wall-like structure um, using uh, boulders, and then you create um, a, a canopy over the top with different vegetation, and the lamprey tend to go there looking for shelter. Um, so it's the, the wall structure creates a safe space for them to, to, to whakata. Ne? And so simple understandings around these concepts have deeper kurahuna or deeper treasures around how our tūpuna understood these animals. And over on this side, uncle is teaching us how to make a pāinanga or a simple um, white bait way. Ne? These are all very simple, but actually doing them and practicing, we got to learn so much about those taonga that we either didn't already know, or that w we thought we knew but didn't know. And that led us into this bigger, deeper dive. And part of that deeper dive is around understanding what we see at the moment in our natural space isn't natural. What we see in our natural spaces are half or even less than half of the ecosystems that should be in play in order for Modi to flow, according to our traditional narratives. Ne? So what we have here is, uh, I suppose, a romantic reimagination of the different Atua spaces. We refer to them as wao atua. And they are atua domains or domains where those atua or source points of energy um, exist and need to exist in order for you to get inanga or um, piharo or lamprey at the bottom end. So through the different cultural narratives, you have the connection between the way, the way in the rako, the way, the rako, um, and the tannins in the water that create the ideal situation for the kai that the lamprey eat, or for the nursery that the lamprey is trying to get to to spawn. Right, we refer to that as whakapapa, or what do you call whakapapa? Genealogy is one word for it. Um, DNA part of it, the sequence, the heke. Ne? Sorry, I don't know what the English terms are. But whakapapa is a bit of DNA, it's a bit of succession, um, it's evolution, it's the understanding that one generation carries on to the next. Ne? And in that, that's where you actually look at getting and populating your whenua, with the different taonga required, um, one for the, for the whenua to be healthy and well, but two, then for you to start creating a bit of an economy on top of it. And now two different um, case studies we looked at, we sort of tried to put them, put them into the space and imagine where they would sit within these wa'atua spaces. So in our Wanganui case study, 
we occupied this space up here in the mid, um, the mid flow of the awa, and then our pa inanga and our whakapari were sort of towards the bottom end. In order for us to understand what was needed here, Uncle then took us on a journey of understanding the source points of the river, the different um, rako and the different wao that feed into that source point, and then the downward flow of Modi of different repo that contribute to the fertility of the water space. Né? And so that's where we ended up anchoring a lot of our mai. As we transitioned from te ao tawhito or the, the, our te ao Māori into the modern day, we started to get to what are some of the examples that we um, have come across through this mahi that explore Māori cultural practice in this space. And we actually found that there are many. So Māra Mā tai tai or clam gardens or some, something similar to a clam garden, um, pā kanai or mullet farms or mullet um, cultivation stations. Is that run? Cultivation stations, those are all some of the different things that we explored um, talking with Komatua up in uh, Te Hikuateka or, the, or Te Reinga, that part of, of the North Island, Rimu Rimu, so um, seaweed gardens. Going all through Aotearoa, there's examples of different pātuna or different um, eel weirs or eel stations. Um, and even as, as far south, I think, as Ohiwa Harbour, there are fish trapping stations on a larger scale um, that we explored um, due to us attending different wānanga or even just having deeper kōrero. You, a lot of our, our mātauranga was acquired through word of mouth. He said, go and see this guy. He knows some kōrero. It's very hard to find this in the mainstream um, mainstream literature. Then we started to get into the space where what are the enablers and disablers? Um, and that was quite a grueling process um, for, for all of us to try and condense that amount of information. But what we have here to sort of start to articulate that are all the regional councils that either have an enabling element or that have um, legislation or I mean regional plans that enable the potential for Māori practice. Right? So you actually have quite a few. And one of the things that we found that <sighs> there's no legislation, policy or um, council that's actually prohibiting any practice. The prohibiting element tends to be more the bureaucracy that get from starting the idea to putting something in the water. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, the relationships required to get okay and access from fellow users of waterways. Yeah? So that becomes the hard bit. But, for example, um, up in the Taitukero, right, Northland, Regional Council, they have, like what Matua talked about um, in our previous quarter, the allocation of up to one hectare of space. Um, um, and then also down in Wanganui, they have read it into the legislation, um, the use of the awa to rebuild um, utu piharo, piharo trapping stations. Um, and, and Patuna stations as well. So there's a lot of um, fertile space, so to speak, for more Māori based practices. One of the main, can you see that? One of the main um, disablers, um, again, is the relationship between Māori and other users of waterways. 
we experience this quite a lot. So this is um, a Pākehā farm that exists between the Marae or down in Ngārua Hine and a Māori reserve area that's owned by the Marae which was a, a Tauranga Waka and a Tauranga Ika, right? a fishing station. There was supposed to be a, there was a paper road written into the plan, but it was never executed. And so the whānau at the marae have to ask permission to the farmer to go through his land to get to their land. And just so happens the day we were going, there are two big boulders that we put it uh, right in the middle of the gate. Gate was padlocked. And so we weren't able to even go and see the space, let alone practice. And so these are some of the, I suppose, local things, right? The, the, the um, things in space that are some of the prohibiting elements um, between Māori and practice and revitalizing mātauranga. Okay. Kāpāi. I'm going to fast forward this. Ah, kāpāi. So we get to our third kōpapa, our third po. Don't know if you can see the picture, but down here, this is a pāhonu, right? Or a, uh, a turtle farm or a turtle um, station where uh, Mount Hawaiian whānau, out. I think this is Wai Manalo, yeah, Wai Manalo on Oahu, um, traditionally would trap turtles and farm turtles, grow turtles and feed ariki, right? So it was, it was a very esteemed and, and high mana based kai. But those practices uh, in in Waidua, in principle, what we aspire to, they currently still try and revive those and and activate those now, and so that's why we thought it was a very awesome concept to go over and just take Fano from our hapu practitioners and apply them into space. This I don't know if you can see this boundary. This is a man-made wall. <coughs> I think it's 30-something hectares. It's quite a big space. This is a pa ika on their scale. Um, and it is a pa limu. It's also a pa kanai. Their mullet over there are veg veg uh, herbivores, right? So they eat vegetable vegetation. So this, for them, is the bottom end of their ecosystem-based ahupuaha system. And what we did is we took our hapu practitioners over to one of their pā and just engaged in one of their hui marama um, roto ika, which is a, a, a hui that they call to build wall and to build the, um, the puaha space. So this is our, our tira. Have our Kelly and myself here. This is the, the Wanganui whānau. And we just exposed ourselves to this amazing event. We were um, invited by uh, Kelly's whanaunga or Kelly's close friend in whānau, uh, Peleke Flores, who was the tohunga of this puaha. There was about two, 2,000 people that attended and all the people that are along this wall are helping to build it. And so what we ended up exposing ourselves to was just the hope and the vision of what could happen tomorrow if we continue to practice. Ne? I'll leave it there, but this is a picture of a, a puna. And they built the they hand built the wall around the puna to um, create a, a bit more of a robust infrastructure around it. But the puna then flows down and into the rotoika. So what we were privy to 
was a bit of a master class on how they understand ecosystems and how to manipulate them using rako, toka, kohatu, all those natural things in a way that is modern but also is um, it makes sense within the cultural context of their mind. And so that was where we ended our kaupapa, but also that's the hope that we can continue to do so. Yeah? So kia ora tato. Um, have a good rest of the day. <laughs>